Start this with a short, it's pretty cool, I found it on YouTube, a uh, little CHF movie. Despite ongoing advances in the management of chronic heart failure, patient outcomes for acutely decompensated disease have not improved. Across Canada, patients hospitalized for heart failure continue to suffer frequent complications and 16.5% die during their initial hospitalization. An examination of the pathophysiology of acute decompensated heart failure identifies promising new avenues for treatment. During heart failure, the heart cannot circulate enough blood with normal cardiac filling pressures to meet the metabolic needs of the brain, kidneys, heart, and other vital organs. The body responds by releasing neurohormones. Certain neurohormones help maintain blood pressure, but over time, they cause heart failure to worsen. One of these neurohormones is weaning, released by the kidneys in response to decreased perfusion and increased sympathetic activity. Renin activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or RAAS, by cleaving angiotensinogen in the liver to produce angiotensin 1, which is further converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. Angiotensin 2 binds to blood vessel walls, causing vasoconstriction. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates the release of endothelin from endothelial cells. Angiotensin 2 and endothelin act on vascular smooth muscle, causing constriction of the coronary arteries and systemic arteries and veins. While vasoconstriction helps maintain blood pressure, it can also have maladaptive effects. For example, the weakened heart must pump harder against increased resistance in the systemic <coughs> arteries, while constriction of the coronary arteries further compromises the myocardial supply of oxygen. Venous constriction also contributes to displacement of fluid into the lungs and other tissues. Angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. Aldosterone causes the kidneys to reabsorb sodium into the bloodstream. With it, water. Sodium and water retention cause a state of fluid overload that is exacerbated by venous constriction. Gaseous exchange in the lungs is inhibited by pulmonary edema. Build-up of fluid in and around the lungs increases the physical work of breathing. Patients with acute left-sided heart failure feel short of breath and fatigue. When right-sided heart failure occurs, fluid accumulates in the liver and legs. Apart from the activity of the RAAS, the body tries to maintain blood pressure using other mechanisms, such as releasing epinephrine from the adrenal glands and norepinephrine from the sympathetic nerve endings. These catecholamines increase heart rate and contractility, in addition to causing arterial and venous constriction. Over time, chronic volume overload and the activity of angiotensin II, aldosterone and endothelin stimulate pathologic cardiac remodeling. The interstitial fibrosis and myocyte apoptosis associated with cardiac remodeling decrease heart wall elasticity, further inhibiting the heart's ability to relax and pump effectively. In summary, the neurohormonal response to heart failure causes vasoconstriction, fluid retention, and increased heart rate and contractility. In turn, these processes initiate a vicious cycle of further myocardial injury and escalating heart failure. Fortunately, additional neurohormonal responses modulate the activity of the RAAS, endothelin, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Yeah, good. You good in there? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're probably sitting here going, "What in the world did he just say? All that stuff." Yeah. What What did that Brit say? You know. I mean, he's. You know, he he keeps saying all these things about this angiotensin and and this. Blah, 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 blah stuff, right? <clears throat> the only reason, the primary reason I showed you that was a trailer of what has become uh, in cardiogenic shock. I mean, not cardiogenic shock, but uh, when we get into cardiac physiology. Before the end, you guys will understand that. So, after cardiac physiology, I'm going to come back and replay that, and you're going to go, oh yeah, I got that. Okay, then. Yeah, because... You understand about all these different things that the way that the the body retains fluid and 
and uh, releases food and, and, and these different processes in CHF. So all that is what is to come, okay? Because it's quite complicated. What we're looking at is just the overview, right? I mean, we're just going to look at the big picture stuff with, with congestive heart failure. So, one thing that we'll see, let's look at something before we get into this. Let me go back to the, my whiteboard. <clears throat> and we have the heart here. And we have the vena cavus. And we have the aorta, right? And when we look at congestive heart failure, we have to look at the fact that we have a right... Remember at the first of school, I said... Later, we're going to talk about the right side and left side of the heart. We're going to separate them. At that time, we were just talking about the heart in general. Now, we're going to separate them into a right pump and a left pump. Before, we just had a pump, right? Now, we're going to look at the uh, right pump and left pump. So, the right side of the heart is pumping blood here through the vena cavas and through that. And then the left side is out through the aorta. That's a very sort of picture that you're going to need in your mind to, to figure out where the backup is coming from. So let's look at right-sided first. Because people with, that are developing CHF, non-acute CHF, not related to a heart attack, okay? Because you can get acute CHF we go into instant failure, all right, and we'll talk about that in a minute when it's associated with an MI. But let's say this patient here is going into congestive heart failure. So the right side of the heart will fail first. It's going to start failing first. So you're going to get symptoms from the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is not working correctly. Right-sided failure will cause left-sided failure. So eventually, this patient is going to, because it's chronic, is eventually going to go into left-sided failure. But let's just say for right now that this patient is in right-sided heart failure. So the right side of the, the right ventricle and the right side of the heart is not pumping the way that it should. So if that pump is not pumping the way that it should, what are you going to get? Backflow or backup, right. So you're going to get a backflow. From the right side of the heart, where's the backflow coming from? Where's it going? Blood is coming up here. The right ventricle, the right side of the heart is not working properly. You have blood flow coming up into the vena cavus. It's not pumping hard enough, so you're getting a backflow. You're getting a decrease in blood flow, decrease in contractility, so you're going to get a backup of blood. Where's that backup going to show up at? Right atrium. Right atrium. Right atrium. Right atrium. The legs, the extremities, the lower extremities. You're going to get a backup of fluid in the extremities. Now we're not going to talk about it now because it would take the rest of the week, but where this all lies, you can write this down for further use because we will talk about it in cardiac physiology, is capillary dynamics. So to give you again a trailer of what's taking place, this blood flow in the vena cava is slowing down because of the right-sided failure. The right side of the heart is not working the way that it should. It's ineffective. So you're going to get backflow of blood. That backflow of blood is going to backflow all the way into the capillaries. Alright? That's where it's going to end up. So if you follow it, it's going to end up in the capillaries, right? The smallest vessel. Now we look at the capillaries... Here, let's, let me try to draw a capillary right there. And it's got a pressure here, just like capillary pressure, up against the wall. Then it's got fluid on the outside of that capillary, correct? 
putting pressure up against that capillary wall. Can everybody see that? So you have a capillary pressure, you have a sort of intracapillary pressure, that's not what it's called, but we'll call it that for now. A pressure inside that capillary, and then you have a pressure outside the capillary that's creating an opposing force. It's creating to keep fluid equal. You've got to have an equal pressure there to keep fluid inside the capillary. Now, if this vena cava backs up all the way down into the capillary, and now there's more pressure inside that capillary, where's the fluid going to go? Yes, there's now, since this back up, there's more fluid, or more pressure inside this capillary. Is it leaking out? It will leak out. Why will it leak out? Right, osmosis. Because <laughs> I don't even say ask Han. <laughs> You've got to uh, because fluid or gas will always move from a, a high pressure to a low pressure, correct? So you're getting a high capillary pressure here, so this pressure inside the capillary is higher than the pressure outside, so that fluid is going to leak out or what we call third space, out into the interstitial fluid. And that's where you get the edema, or the cankles. Their ankles are <laughs> <and laughs> swelling, okay? You're going to see that in the hospital. We'll point that out. A lot of people come in with peripheral, arms and legs, peripheral edema. Edema or swelling or fluid in there. All right? And it's because of this. And that's just a taste of capillary dynamics. It's much more complicated than that, but that's sort of the easy way to look at it. <coughs> so, dude, because of this pressure, ineffective right side of the heart, we get this back up all the way down to the capillaries. The capillaries start leaking uh, due to osmosis, the difference in pressure, and then you get the cankles. You get this uh, peating edema down into the ankles and, and legs, right? That's right-sided failure. One other thing that you will see in right-sided failure that you'll want to use your stethoscopes to listen to is you will get a third heart tone. What are the two heart sounds that we have now? Or, or the real name for it? The real name for it, you got it right on your test. The, two, the normal two heart tones we hear is what? Maybe you didn't get it right. Yeah. <laughs> S1 and S2. Huh? Oh, I didn't hear you. It's okay if you get one thing. Even if you said it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be okay. So, the normal heart tones that you get is S1, S2. S1 is the love, S2 is the dove. Okay? Uh... So you get S1, S2 sounds. Those are normal. Those are from the closing of the valve. In CHF, right-sided failure, you get an S3. You get an extra sound in there. Typically, this is in, and this is in an older person. A younger athlete may, may have an extra sound, but that's normal for them. Uh, in an older person that you're looking at for CHF, by the way, much older than me. Okay. Uh, you get this S3 sound. So you get ba-boom, 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 normal, right? In S3 sound, you get an extra sound there that sounds like Tennessee. So when you're listening, you go, it goes Tennessee. So the C, Tenna, Tenna is the love dub, right? C. So you get Tennessee, Tennessee. So when you're listening to an S3, you can almost pick up that rhythm, which is Tennessee, Tennessee. Right? That S3 sound, okay, will show up a lot of times before the edema. So you and I've done this. You can hear that S3, and you can diagnose that patient almost with right-sided failure in the el more elderly patient because you get that S3 sound. You get that extra sound in an ad. The S3 sound in an elderly patient is an abnormal sound. All right? So you get that Tennessee, 
Tennessee. I've got some sounds coming up to show you the different sounds, okay? So everybody good with the uh, right-sided failure? What about the left side? Now you had, you go through a period of time, patient does, right-sided failure, now the, the heart is weakening and weakening and weakening, and now you have left-sided failure. Where's the backup going to be in left-sided failure? Hey, 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 hey. In, in left-sided failure, the lungs, right. In left-sided failure, you're going to get pulmonary edema. Pulmonary lungs, you're going to get pulmonary edema. So now, you're going to get fluid in the lungs. So now you're going to have abnormal sounds or breath sounds in the lungs. That's how you tell if you have fluid in the lungs, is that you can hear it. And we'll, we'll speak of that in a minute. Also, with left-sided failure, you're going to get another heart tone. You're going to get an S4. Right? And an S4 sound sounds like Kentucky. You connect, you listen and go, Kentucky, 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 Kentucky. You have that extra sound in there. No, it, it, it'll break it down into four. It sounds... Kentucky, it's like Kentucky. Well, you have sort of a drifting sound there. We'll listen to it. And you're, when you hear it, you go, oh yeah, I hear the Kentucky in it, or Tennessee, Tennessee, you know, into the different. Now, when you guys are in the SICU or in the hospital or the ER, you have someone come in with CHF, you should sort of automatically start thinking, hey, I'm going to listen to those heart sounds, right? And listen for those S3, S4 sounds. So they give you something... When you see it, they're coming in, they present with what we're about to talk about with CHF, they present with that, and then once they get the patient stabilized, go listen to those heart tones. Tell the nurse that, hey, we just learned about CHF, kind of listen for those, the different heart tones. And they're, they'll go, wow, really? Okay, go ahead. And it's nothing to listen to heart tones. All right, so everybody good there? The, the, um, the other thing is called Starling's Law. Starling's Law. A rubber band. What I call the rubber band law. Starling came up with this thing, and there's several Starling events, but we'll talk about sort of the way the heart contracts. So if you look at me with this rubber band, and I'm stretching it, relaxing it, right? And it's coming back to its normal place, right? So you can go boom, 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 right? It's, it's stretching out. It's coming back to its normal place. Heart's contracting away, right? Well, in CHF, you get a backup in these ventricles, and over a period of time, it's going to stretch those ventricles. It's going to stretch that myocardium out where those, those ventricles are going to be big. You get a CHF patient, try to look at their chest x-ray. Go in where the doc is and ask them, hey, you know, now look at that chest x-ray on this, this CHF patient. And you'll see this huge heart in there. It's not because they're so nice, it's because they have CHF, okay? Because what happens here, Starling said, okay, in the normal heart, as it contracts, it's going to come back to its original place. Right? And contracting, and you can sort of see it's coming back, it's contracting blood. In a CHF patient, because it's so stretched out, it's not going to come back to its original place. Now, that's a decrease in contractility, right? Good contractility, poor contractility. And that's going to decrease cardiac output, right? Plus, cause more backup. So it's doing a, a normal heart. Will, the, the myocardial fibers will come back to rest in, a, in its almost original place, right? In CHF, it won't because it's stretched out. It won't because 
if I took this rubber band over a period of time and kept stretching it and stretching it and stretching it, right, eventually it wouldn't come back. It would be stretched out. Can everybody see that? Okay, and that's what Starling came up with, and that sort of defines this, what happens to the heart muscle itself when in CHF. So it's being stretched out, and it is stretched out, and so it's not going to return back to its original, I guess, strength. And so it's doing, uh, there's a better word for that, I just don't know what it is. Uh, original form, and so you're going to lose contractility with that. Everybody good? So, with CHF, These are the signs that you're going to see. So now you have this patient, cardiac compromise, that fits, because anything wrong with the heart, that blanket term. All right. So why the mild confusion? Oh, they're probably out of order in your packet. I added some sides. So mild confusion. Why mild confusion? Well, less oxygen, less cardiac output, less oxygen, anxiety. These patients are not going to be able to breathe. If they have left sided failure, they're going to have uh, pulmonary edema. That edema in the lungs is not going to allow the lungs to diffuse. All right? Increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate because of the, uh, the extra work on the heart. Dysmia, can't lie them flat. This is a big thing, with, and now we're talking left-sided failure, okay? In a patient with left-sided failure, if you look at this, this is a 45-degree angle, it's a semi-fowler's position, okay? This would be supine. A CHF patient would want to sit at a 90-degree angle. Let's say they have pulmonary edema, they have... Uh, fluid in, in their base, I mean, in their uh, apexes of their lungs. What happens? Let's, then let's say the fluid's down here with this stick. I have fluid down in here. As I do this, which way is the fluid going? That way, towards the top. So it's going towards the head, or it's going to, when, as you lay the patient flat, their lungs start to fill it with fluid. And it feels like they're drowning. It, it literally feels like they're drowning. So they're going to have a lot of anxiety. If you try to lay them flat, they won't lay flat. Because it feels like they're drowning. It's like holding them underwater. So, like puncture, hmm? like yeah, they'll put a chest tube in. That's right. E eventually they will put a chest tube in there and, and drain that fluid poten uh, potentially. Not all the times, but sometimes. So they don't, they won't lay flat because of that pending feeling of drowning. Right here you can put through, have JVD, or jugular vein distension. Jugular vein distension is that extended neck vein. That's from the back up of the vena cava, right? The superior vena cava, you get that jugular vein distension. As... It starts to worsen, okay? You might get this, what's called this pink sputum. That's, that might be a new word for you guys, sputum or spit or saliva. Uh, when you have, when the fluid backup gets worse, let's say you start getting some fluid back up in your lungs, okay? It's in the basis, it starts to fill up, that container, the lungs start to fill up with fluid. Eventually, where's the fluid going to go? Hmm? Out your mouth. Because it, it's just going to build up. And uh, everybody go to Starbucks and get you sort of a, a latte. You know how they, they froth that milk on top of it? That's what it looks like. As it comes out the mouth, it looks like that cappuccino froth. But it has a pink tinge to it because of the blood and the capillaries. 
So you're going to get this pink, frosty pulmonary edema, okay? In the most severe case, the patient could be sitting upright, and it, uh, it come out, you, you start to come out the mouth, and it looks just like that. Next time you go to Starbucks and get your cappuccino, look at that froth, and that's what it looks like. That, and just add a little pink tinge to it, and you have uh, frothy pulmonary edema. Okay, so now you look at that, now this patient, let's say this patient's really bad, they're having this pulmonary edema coming out, so what do you got to do now? How do you fix that? And how would you get the liquid out? Suction. You have to suction that out. Because that's an airway problem, right? Now they have fluid in their, in their trachea, in their upper airway, and it's blocking off uh, airflow. They're, they're not getting hardly any airflow because of this. You'll get blood pressure problems, heart rate problems. This abdominal distension is just from that, that fluid, the buildup of that fluid, third spacing in there. Uh, and then the lower edema in the lower extremities as well. So all these combined, you're going to have, this is what you get with CHF. So shortness of breath, anxiety, diaphoresis, high blood pressure. In respiratory problems, you get what's called a tripoding position, where the patient will want to sit up and try sort of tripod and try to expand their lungs out, get their lungs, their their lung, a thoracic cavity a little bit bigger, to try to get more air in. That's a sign of severe respiratory distress when you start looking at that. And then rapid heart rate swelling in the feet and legs, JVD, put that down as distended neck veins. Just go ahead and use the right term, jugular vein distension. As you start to worsen, as this patient starts to worsen, you get cyanosis. Cyanosis is what? The bluish tint, lack of oxygen, right? So now you start to worse. Confusion is starting to set in. You get this cyanosis. <laughs> Cyanosis will initially show up in the fingernail beds and the mucous membranes in the mouth and the, and the lips. So you get this, and now the patient, due to some cerebral hypoxia, is starting to get really confused, combative. You can't lay the patient down. You're trying to suction them. So what do you think here that, that your treatment is? So this patient comes in and presents to you with acute CHF. What's going to be your treatment? Oxygen. Set them up right. Huh? What would you say? Same thing? What? Do we get them angular? So you would, you may have to suction. What are you going to do about that fluid? Okay, in a worse condition, mowers, right, they, they would put a chest tube in and they would drain that fluid. They can start them on medication. The medication, the primary medication is, is, is the one that we will use called Lasix. And Lasix uh, is a diuretic. Lasix will make you go to the bathroom. So they're going to give them some Lasix uh, and, and help them diurese or pull that fluid out through, through the urinary tract, okay? So Lasix, Lasix, they're giving Lasix, which is a diuretic, and they don't start that. They give them some nitro. Why do they give them the nitro? Right, to lower their blood pressure, good. And now they don't give them some morphine. Morphine's their friend. <laughs> so why they don't give them morphine? To, uh, hmm? to reduce the preload. Exactly. Reduce, reduce the preload. Reduce the workload of the heart. Okay? Same way they do in an MI. So you've got the treatment. I've got to get used to
started using this little whiteboard. <clears throat> so the treatment is oxygen, right? Nitro, nitroglycerin, that's a NTG, it's the abbreviation for nitro. If you flip them, NGT, it's not nasal gastric tube. <laughs> huh? So you want to give them a diuretic, or, and we'll just stick with Lasix right now, and morphine to reduce the preload. That's their, that's their treatment. You're trying to get that fluid off of their, of their lungs. So that'd be the treatment for you, you guys to... That's not how you spell morphine, but... Uh, <laughs> so the... Uh, the one thing that we didn't speak of is the edema. You guys will be able to do this, this test in the hospital. So someone comes up, they have peripheral edema, they got the swollen leg. Uh, you need to judge that edema some way. And it's called pitting edema. Has anybody ever seen that when you push in on, a, on the extremity, like someone wearing socks and they take their socks off and they still have the band around it? Yeah. Uh, people with edema, the way that you test that is you push in on the edema, not hard because it's tender, you push in on the edema and it creates a little pit in there. And then you sit there and you count how long it takes that pit to, to surface back. <clears throat> Most of the time, you're, you're going to be there longer than what you want. So it, it's the same with capillary refill. Capillary refill is measured less than two, right? Mm -hmm. It's normal. So if you have delayed capillary refill, it's just greater than two. So in pitting, pitting edema, you push in on this the edema, and you'd wait, and you'd look at that pit, and probably about after four seconds, you would just put pitting edema greater than four seconds. I've done that test, and 20 minutes later, when we got to the hospital, we would still have this pit. And it looked like I took my sand wedge to it and hit a nice little divot in it. So that's, again, something else to look for as you uh, go to the hospital. You're looking at the extremity. They have the pitting edema. They have a history of CHF. Listen for heart tones. Check the pitting edema. Uh, listen to lung sounds that we're going to pick up here in a second. So they have different lung sounds. So now we're starting to really add on to the stuff that you guys can do. Now, for you guys who are on the floor, right? You're going, <laughs> oh, what do we do? Go look for one of these CHF patients. Okay? Ask the nurse, do you have any CHF patients on the floor? Oh, you know, you know 315. Then go to 315. And go in there and check it out, right? That's what you're there for. So the, the sounds, so you have the pitting edema. Everybody understands the pitting edema, correct? So you have the pitting edema. Uh, you have the different lung sounds. This will go through all of them. This goes through wheezes and some different things, I believe, as well. But we're going to discuss, and you have to listen closely. Uh, so we're, we're going to discuss just a couple of them. I don't see anybody with a straw in it. But, but the first one is called RAL, R-A-L-E-S. Uh, it's the first lung sound that you hear. RALS is fluid in the smaller airways. So you're going to hear RALS in the basis, I mean in the... Uh, apexes of the lungs, or the bottom part of the lungs. So when you listen to lung sounds in the bottom part, you're going to hear, in the CHF patient with left-sided failure, you're going to hear more than likely rails, or they're called crackles. They're the same thing. Uh, if we had a canned Coke, we could do that. Uh, we could all listen. Next time you get a 
we we'll have to go get a can of soda, carbonated soda or something. You pop the carbonated soda and you take your stethoscope and you listen to the, you put your stethoscope over the hole and listen. What's coming out of the yes. carbon dioxide right? yeah. coming out? Bubbling. That's what rails sound like. It's a very wow. sort of a bubbly sound in, in the smaller airways in the lungs. So you sort of get that sound that you hear uh, over that, that coat. We'll try that experiment later when we just want to have the carbonated beverage. But the, uh, put your stethoscope over there. And so rails or crackles are airways. It's air moving through fluid, but it's moving through the fluid in the smaller airways. The other one that you're going to hear is called ronchi, R-H-O-N-C-I, C-H-I, something like that. Ronchi, I think that's in your notes somewhere. Yeah, it is. So you're going to hear ronchi, and ronchi is fluid moving through the larger airways. I know everybody has done this, where you have a, a, a drink with, oh, you have one. There we go, let me do this. You, you have a drink with the straw in it, and everybody in the world has blown air into that made bubbles, right? Yeah. So go ahead and blow air into it. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Hear that sound? That's ronchi. That's what ronchi will sound like. It's air, it's fluid moving through or air moving through fluid in the larger airways. So you have fine crackles or fine <coughs> airway sounds, fluid moving through the smaller airways, or you have fluid moving through the larger airway. Either way, especially in the basis, that fluid is decreasing what? At, at the alveolus level. What is that fluid doing? Diffusion, right? Air can't diffuse through that fluid. It's too thick. As it gets into the bronchial, right, it's just de cre creating a pulmonary pressure there and you're not able to get air down to the alveolus the way that we should. So listen to this carefully because it's not very loud, I don't think. Okay, so I know that was sort of quick, but uh, YouTube's your friend. That's where I got that. So you can go in there and, and train your ear the same way with the blood pressures. Okay, you got to train your ear what to listen for, right? When you start listening to lung sounds, you have to sort of train your ear what to hear for. Now, to back up, since I just thought of it, what about where do you listen for the S3 and S4 sounds at? Because you listen for different sounds somewhere else, right? And I can't remember off the top of my head, so. Uh, that would be a good thing when you guys go to listen for this, uh, to ask your nurse. 
Where do you listen for this S4, S3 sound? And they'll show you if they know. I'll tell you, I have to go get my cheat sheet. I'll tell you before we get out of here where to listen for those S3 and S4 sounds. But <clears throat> do you see now how your role in the hospital or how your learning has multiplied greatly? Because now you know, oh, this guy's having a STEMI, and these are things that are taking place in the STEMI. He's having a non STEMI. This is taking place. You get assigned to the cath lab. You know why that person's in the cath lab, right? Huh? Patient comes in with CHF. You know what to, how that patient's going to present, what they're going to do. They don't put oxygen on them. They don't give them a diuretic. They'll probably give them some morphine. Uh, their pressure's up. They may give them some nitro or some other medicine to drop their pressure. You know to go over there and listen for S3 and S4 sounds and listen to rails and ronca. Especially you guys with respiratory. This is where you would engage them in conversation, especially with the CHF patient. They will be more than glad to teach you about these lung sounds and to, and to show you. And They know far more than I do about the respiratory system. That's why they're in respiratory therapist, right? But so the... Uh, so as we move forward, you know, by the spring, you guys will be really set as far as a lot of different things that you'll be able to participate in. So make sure you, just like everything, make sure that you do a good, complete assessment. Vital signs, get your good sample, set them upright, provide high concentration of oxygen to them. All right. We would go ahead and in your scenarios with the CHF patient, you would administer Lasix. So don't you know what Lasix does? It's a diuretic. It's going to diurese. It's going to pull fluid out of the, those spaces through the urinary system. We'll learn a lot more about that in cardiac physiology, like the movie, how it does it, right? But for now, in your scenarios, you would just say, I'm going to administer the patient some Lasix. Uh, the dose is usually around 40 to 80 milligrams. So you don't give them some Lasix. Give them some morphine. 2 to 10 milligrams on the morphine. All right. You may give them uh, some nitro, 0.4 milligrams sublingual. So these are things that you're going to work through in your scenario. With, with CHF. So that's, make sure that you've got the treatment modality down past oxygen. Oxygen, Lasix, morphine, nitro. Huh? Or a diuretic. You may not give them. There's other uh, diuretics besides Lasix that you might want to give them. Um, how much oxygen do you give? Just a non rebreather. 10 to 15 liters per minute. You might need to suction. You might need to ventilate the patient. Huh? If they're having that frothy pulmonary edema, if their cappuccino's coming out at you, uh, you may need to vent suction and ventilate. They may not, you might add, need to add uh, ventilatory support to them. All right? Everybody good with that sort of overview of CHF? Any, any questions there? Everybody good? It is a respiratory distress. CHF, the patient will come in in respiratory distress, but it's cost the fluid. This is getting more into other <coughs> respiratory distresses, but we'll look at these overall things right quick. Desmia, noisy breathing, would mean that they have the, the wheezes, the rails, the ronchi, the strider perhaps, okay? Altered mental status due to the lack of oxygen. Irregular breathing, they're, they're, we are supposed to have symmetrical rise and fall of the chest 12 to 20 times per minute. When you start having difficulty breathing, it might get irregular for some reason. And then that workload that is going to increase uh, for trying to breathe. And then these are just the different, at that we'll get into next time, 
asthma, pulmonary embolism or a PE, just could be allergies, allergic to something, could have an airway obstruction causing that snoring or strider. Here this COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is where CHF falls in, but there's other ones in there, asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, they're all fit in there, hyperventilation, you know, I had a patient this weekend, she was upset, it was more, uh, more of an emotional thing uh, than anything, I don't know, she had a lot of problems, but uh, well, I think she was faking seizures, for one, but she started having these, she started hyperventilating, and I was just like, don't do that, don't, don't work yourself up, you start to hyperventilate. So you, you might have to, in hyperventilation, you might just have to calm the patient down. All right, we won't get into emphysema today. We don't stop there.